Well, I want to get right into the, the message, your chasing God theme, Hebrews 12, 1, 2, 3, I believe it was. Wherefore, seeing we are compassed. By the way, I just want to get after it. Is that okay? I have not an introductory fluff or anything because I have the potential to be long. <laughs> it's because you don't listen fast enough if you never can. <clears throat> Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has set down the right hand of the throne of God. Now consider him, I'm going to give you a couple more verses. Uh, now consider him who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your mind. I love this next one. For you've not resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Come on, how many, how many of you be willing to admit, we kind of wimp out when it, you're going to let me take that alone or anybody know what I just said? <laughs> My cross gets heavy, I dump it. Anybody know what I meant by that now? Okay, I, I'm too guilty of not being like Jesus. But nonetheless, Jesus endured and uh, as an example for us. Now, Hebrews 12 is obviously right after that chapter of the heroes of faith, and he lists all of these people. Um, by faith, it starts right out. It gives you what the definition of faith is. and said, through faith we understand the world is framed by the word of God. Then by faith, Abel offered a better sacrifice. And by faith, Enoch. And by faith, uh, what it was, Noah built a boat and that kind of stuff. And by faith, Abraham. By faith, Sarah. By faith. And it just goes by all of these by faith. So I've got to go back to chapter 11 to find, because the person I want to talk about tonight. Because I pray, I say, God, what do you want me to preach on? I, I, I just want to know, what do I need to preach on? And uh, I really feel like your prayers for me for this night, because I know you're, you're bathing in prayer, that I sat down. Don't you love it when it comes quick? I mean, sometimes you can study and study and study, and you know what you have? Just what you had in the book. I don't need a sermon. I need a message from God. Are you following me? I, I need to hear something from God. And this, is, this is one of those kind of messages, so I'm kind of looking forward to preaching it. <laughs> uh, a sermon is like, is like a baby. You don't know what it looks like until it's delivered. <laughs> So here we go. We'll see how this baby looks tonight after this, okay? Okay, here we go. Not very deep, but nonetheless, that's where I'm at, okay? All these by faith, guys, now. Look over here in verse 33. If you have your Bibles, verse 33 of chapter 11 says, Who through faith? Who through faith? Um... The person is not listed in there. It's not Noah, it's not Abraham, it's not Moses, it's not Joseph, it's not David, it's not Barak, it's not those, the names in me. But he's in here because he gives this grocery list of people that apply in the Old Testament. Because when the New Testament's being written, the only thing to have the reference is the Old Testament. And whatever things were written in an earlier time were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. So we can look at things, hi, you know... If you believe in Jesus, you're born again. Your God is the same God of those Old Testament heroes. Would you agree with that now? We yes. don't have two gods for different times. It's the same God existing in three persons, one God. Yea, the Lord our God is one God, okay, existing in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Mystery, can I understand that? Not on my best day. Do I believe it? With all my heart. I understand because I believe it. See, faith must precede all attempts to reason. If you try to shrink God down to your understanding, my understanding, he's nothing more than a product of your own brain. How many of you are glad he's a little bigger than that? Anybody glad of that? But he can be embraced by faith, and God loves faith. He just loves faith, through faith. You can only live so long off someone else's faith. Let me say that again. You can only live so long. How many of you know that your children can only live off your parents' faith so long, but eventually it's got to become their faith? They've got to... Uh, the discipler and the disciple, I got to go. He said, I'm leaving. I'm going to send a comforter. Your faith will actually do more without leaning on me all the time. Come on, would you agree with that? Yeah. You can walk with, with, with God. Okay, God, He came to do the will of the Father. You can do that. And so we can only live so long. We have responsibility for our faith. It can be weak. It can be strong. Romans chapter 4, verse 19 um, it's about Abraham, who through faith, no, that's okay, I'm taking this out of your time, <laughs> how many of you are glad when you can't remember it, it is some place where you can find it, are you glad of that, it's in Romans chapter 4, 
Maybe I put down the first word of it in there. Ah, and being not weak in faith, so it's possibly weak in faith. How do you know when Abraham lied about Sarah and said she's my sister rather than my wife? How do you know his faith is kind of weak right then? How do you know that Hagar gig? Nah. So there's times when his faith, but he got to the place where his faith become. Saying, be not weak in faith, he considered not his own body, now dead, when he was about 100 years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. Now, if you know the context, the angel shows up and tells him, you and Sarah are going to about to have this child. He's 100. He promised him that 25 years ago. Nothing's happened. That's the reason they took things in their own hand, try to make, try to help God out. How do you know when we try to help God out, we mess things up? But nonetheless, he's, here he is 100, and by the way, both of them laugh. Sarah's over here, oh, yeah, right, I'm 90, I don't even have cycles anymore. <laughs> By the way, I can tell you something, if that old gal and I, if she ended up pregnant, we're going to name it Isaac, I don't care what it is, a boy or a girl. <laughs> you got it, you got it. Do you realize what an act of faith it was? Because this is not immaculate conception, the Holy Spirit ain't going to overshadow that old man and that old woman. <laughs> because he believed God, you see. He got to the place he believed God. Now, let me give you this verse again. Who, and be not weak in faith, he considered not his own body. Now dead, he's about 100 years old. So he's had a lot of years of working his faith, and up and down, strong and weak. And all this. Be not weak in faith, he considered not his own body. Now dead, he's about 100 years old. Neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He, he staggered not at the promise of God, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. And when that child was born... A number of years later, you know what happened? God said, now take their son, your only son, Isaac, whom you to a mountain that I'll show you and offer him to me a sacrifice. He said, I'm early in the morning. I'll have the boy carry the wood. I'll carry the fire and the knife, and he's going up. That strong face, say amen. amen. If he'd asked him to do that 25 years ago and he'd given to him, he would still pop, potentially be able to do this. He'd have never done it. How do you like to have strong faith in an instant that you can't have because it's a journey? It's strength. Okay, let me try this. When I was 13 years old, I was six foot three and weighed 100. I flunked the fifth grade, so I'm already a year above everybody else. I couldn't read, so I flunked the fifth grade. And so I, I just grew. I'm one of these, <laughs> grew, and I, I weighed 130 pounds. You know what six foot three and 130 pounds look like? I could disappear. <laughs> I look like a zipper. That's all. I look. There's nothing to me. Arms look like broomsticks, same size up here as they were down here. Just bone, little skin wrapped around. Couldn't walk, you know, <laughs> clumsy and... And I began to walk like this because if you, you see this sometimes, a guy gets a real growth spurt, a, a boy does when he gets real tall and he's above everybody, he, he feels conscious of it. And, he, and I began to walk like this, kind of bent over. And my mother caught me. She sang that great old hymn to me. Oh, walk like a man. No. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, you stand up. She said, God giving you height for some reason. You, you stand up. He made you this way. And so, but I was skinny, clumsy. Oh my goodness. I was walking home from school. One time, 13 years old, walking with Tim Perry, and him and I was walking down the side, we see these two punks coming at us. And they roll up the cigarettes and you know, they <laughs> jump back into the 50s, okay, the 60s, that, that's when. We see him coming, and I'm just ready to step off the side. And he started pushing us around, smacked me a couple times, took off running, scared. I was scared for a year I was going to run to them guys again. Scared to death. And my folks asked me that. See, that would have been happening in the fall. And my folks said, what do you want for Christmas? Now, when you're 13 years old, you're not a little kid anymore. You're kind of like some bone arrows and stuff. But you don't, really want, you're, you're, you don't know who you are when you're 13. But I'd seen a magazine, an old Ted Williams. Some of you don't have a clue who this was. Okay. He was the muscle man of the day. Okay. And I said, he got that by lifting weights. I said, I want some weights. And he got me these old Ted Williams weights. Okay. And I faithfully began to lift weights. And by the way, if you've ever noticed when a person grows real tall, then they get to a point, they start plunking out. They, start, they stop going this way, and they start going this way. And it was a good timing for me. I started pumping iron. And I faithfully, about a year later, a little over a year later, I weighed 190 pounds. And then about less than a year later, I was six foot four and I weighed 215 pounds. And I remember thinking to myself, I'd like to see them punks now. <laughs> Help yourself to the mustard, baby. Now, the reason I said that is, you, see, we can relate to that. How do you know they're spiritual bullies? The world, the flesh, and the devil. We're supposed to overcome them. You know how you overcome them? Who are born of God, overcome of the world? And what is the victory to overcome of the world? Even our faith. You can't live off somebody else's faith to live in this world and be the man you're supposed to be and the woman you're supposed to be. I can't live off somebody else. I've got to get strong. The Bible talks all about, but ye beloved, building up yourselves. Don't you wish you could hire someone to do your exercising? <laughs> it don't work. I got to do that. 
Diet and exercise. Paul told Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6, that you need to be nurtured up in the words of faith. If all you read is junk food, if all you eat is junk food, pop potatoes, it's candy, all that stuff that I love. I used to mainline donuts. Just, oh. <laughs> How do you know a steady diet of that won't give good strength and good health? Say amen to that now. But when you begin to eat the good diet and you exercise, you ask any doctor, tell you, if you want something to enhance your health, eat good food and exercise. It's the same thing spiritual. You're supposed to nurture yourselves. If you only read Sports Illustrated, and I ain't throwing stones at Sports but if that's all you read and never read the Bible, if you only read the New York Times, if you only read the... And never read your Bible, do you know how many times Jesus said in Matthew's account, have you not read? Have you not read? Do you not err not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God? Just, just, just the reading of the word of God. Who through faith. Faith can be weak and can be strong. Do you know that faith can fail? Luke twenty two thirty. What Jesus says to Peter. Simon, Simon. That's his pre-Jesus name. It's not Petros, Petros. That he surnamed him. He said, Simon, Simon. Satan had desired to have you. To sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you. You know, you know what he prayed? That his faith would fail not. Why would he pray that? Because your faith can fail. People, we have who through faith. We need to strengthen our faith. Can I tell you something? Weak faith ain't going to make it in the culture we live in today. It ain't going to cut it. You got to know who you are. You got to know what this book says. You got to read it. Got to study and memorize and meditate. I got to live it. I got to obey. Faith without works is dead. Being alone, it needs exercise. This ain't the message. This is introduction, okay? We'll get to that in just a little bit. I'm going to do this quick. Jesus, Galilee, boat, sleep, storm, panic, rebuke, calm. How many of you followed that? Did I? I, Okay, you're you're with me. I I can't take you there to take the time I'd like to. There's just so many good things. Calm. You know the question he asked when he spoke? And he calmed the storm instantly. He said, where is your faith? You know what that that little section started out? He said, let's get into the boat and go to the other side. Faith says, if he says we're going to the other side, we're going to make it. He just never promised us a pleasure cruise. (laughs) Come on. Would you agree with this? You see, how have you lived long enough, though, that the storms come up on Galilee in your life? Come on. He can rebuke them. But he's saying, what about you? I said, we're going to the other side. Let's ride this sucker out. Let me sleep. I'm tired. You people wear me out. That ain't in there, but (laughs) here's your How do you know he did get exhausted in ministry? Would you agree with this now? Oh, faith, dear people. Faith, faith, faith. God's going to try your faith. He's going to test your faith. Beloved, why think it's strange concerning the fire trial, which is sent to test you as though some strange thing happened unto you? What, do you live in a convent or something? I don't think so. Is someplace cloistered away from the world? Out of range of the devil? Come off it. Why is faith so important? Because this is the only chance we get to live by faith. You will need no faith in heaven. It'll all be sight. Come on, say amen to that. People in hell will not need faith. It will be a reality. Do you know that God loves faith? Hebrews eleven six. But without faith, it is impossible please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I have diligently sought so many unimportant things, given myself to them without question, and labored for them, and have labored for the food which perisheth, to the neglect of the stuff that will last forever. I've done it. I spent spent too much of my life wasting it on the temporal and not the eternal. Faith, eternity, promises. You are God. Take care of your, dear, of your faith, dear people. It's the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Who through faith? Well, let's go to the message. The one I want to talk to you about, his name is not mentioned in here, but he shows up down here. Let's see. Who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions. Now, how you know, who, who comes to mind when it thinks about stop the mouths of lions? Daniel, okay, so his name's not mentioned here, but this is the things that characterize him. Quench the violence of fire. Okay, Shadrach, Meshach, right. Um, 
escape the edge of the sword. That's the one I want to, I want to talk about. The man that would escape the edge of the sword. His name was Elisha. I want to turn to, if you have your Bibles, I'd like to turn to this. You can. Um, where do you say he escaped the edge of the sword? Let me find it here in my notes. 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings chapter 6. Let me give you the story, then I may read it. It takes time to do that, uh, but that's okay. Sometimes I'm up here preaching away, and I'm an old-fashioned preacher. People, <laughs> you already knew this. It's all I do is read a few verses and holler about it, okay? <laughs> ah, I'm excited about this, okay? That's, if you want this great exegetical one, Romans 1, 2, 3, I'm not your man, okay? But I, I'm excited about this. This, this, is, this is good stuff. Elisha. Elisha had had the baton handed him from Elijah. Both of them, the bona fide prophets in Israel, not Judah. The separation of the kingdom. I don't know how much of your Bible you have, but Judah. Excuse me, uh, the northern kingdoms. He was a prophet sent to them, to minister to them. He had been given... Okay, how you ever heard about Naaman the leper, and he told him to go dip in the Jordan seven times? Have you ever heard that account? Okay, some of you have, have heard that. So this is the prophet that did that. This is the one that the guy's chopping. They're down by the Jordan, and it... Phew, axe head flies out in there. He said, oh, man, I, I, have to, I, I, I borrowed this axe. He said, I got to get that axe. And, it's not, and he prayed, and the thing floated. How do you know when you start doing them kind of things, people realize you got contact with deity. Okay, so he was a prophet of God. And so now the king of Syria... Okay, here's Israel, Syria, Damascus, just north, old city. So he's up here in Syria. And the king of Syria comes down to make war with the Israelites, the nation of Israel. And the king would say, let's set an ambush for their army at such and such a place. And God would tell Elisha, go tell the king of Israel that the army of the Syrians are encamped here. Don't go that way. Bypass them. And they had it all set up, good traps. And he did this a couple of different times. In fact, more than two times. Not once, not twice. So two, three, three, four times. And the king suspects there's the king of Syria, a, suspects a spy within his own camp. He said, hey, who's spilling the beans? Who's giving away our positions? We can't, how can we defeat an enemy? We, every time we go to set up a trap for him, he escapes it. Somebody's tipping him off. And one of his men said to him, I'll tell you who it is. He said, it's Elisha, the prophet of God. The man of God is what he called him. It was Elisha, the man of God. He said, he can hear what you whisper in your bedroom. And he reveals it to the king. So how do you know, old Elisha's got an ear toward heaven. Are you following this at all? This guy's got, got contact with God. And so he's in Dothan. Let me tell you where Dothan's at. If you know where Israel is, and go 50 miles straight north. Okay, you got the Jordan over here. You got the Mediterranean over here. Mediterranean's over here, Jordan's over here, Galilee's up here, and you came down here about 20 miles to Dothan. Dothan is a city right here. Down here is Samaria. Jesus, the woman of Samaria, you remember that <laughs> account? Okay, so here's Jerusalem. There it is, about 50 miles straight north. So it's a real city. And he says, you find out where that prophet is. And if we can't, if we can't defeat him because he's telling our battle plans, he said, you find out where he's at. Somebody found out where he's at. He was in Dothan. And for some reason, he was up on a Mount Dothan. In fact, in Dothan, in that area of Israel today, they have a rise, a mound in that area. It's kind of the hill country. And they've named it, now whether it is or not, the Mountain of Elisha. They call it that, even today in modern Israel. And he's up on the mountain. I don't know why. Maybe he felt closer to God. How many of you have ever felt certain places you feel, just because of the geography? Anybody know what I mean? Have you ever stand on the lake and look at the sunset or something? You know, certain places you just feel closer to God. I don't know why he's up there, but that's where he's at. He's up on Dothan. And in the morning, he tells his servant, Gehazi, he said, I want you to go down and get provisions. So he's going to go down to the town because he's up on the mountain. He's going to go down to the town. He starts down the town. It's just first light, just starting to break. He sees it's surrounded. Now, somebody told him that Elisha was in Dothan. He's up on the mount. He says he's in Dothan. And they surround the city. He sees it. And he tears off, runs back up to Elisha. He said, oh, my Lord, what are we going to do? We are surrounded. And Elisha's picking his teeth and says, I'm not sure he's picking his teeth, okay? <laughs> well, I didn't see that. Unless. It ain't in there, okay? How about this? Elisha is not troubled. How about that, okay? He's very calm and he says, 
there's more with us than there are with them. And he's thinking, that poor old boy's been in the sun one too many days. <laughs> you, me, army of us. And then he prays a prayer. He said, oh, my God, open his eyes. Give him a scene. What, what the real score is. And all of a sudden, he could see that they were, some, here's the army, got them surrounded. Here's the chariots of fire and the angelic hosts surrounding all of them, multitudes, multitudes of them. And okay, as I says, oh. <laughs> That's another loose translation. You're going to have a hard time finding that. <laughs> How you know these are real people? The same God we got and the same commodities, faith. See, Elisha believed God. He's, he's bringing his old servant along with him. He says, what are we going to do? He said, let's go down and meet him. And he comes down to him, and they see the problem. Now listen, this guy's never had a haircut or a shave. Okay? He's, he's got the mantle of Elijah, and he wears the girl. He, he, he's a Nazarite. Okay? He, they spot him. And they, he gets near him, and they're thinking, he's going to surrender to us. He raises his hands and prays a prayer. Oh, God, smite the Syrians with blindness. Whoa. All of them are blind. Now, I guarantee you, some of you feel real familiar with this place in here. If you couldn't see at all, before you'd make it to that door, you're going to want somebody to help you because you're going to be stumbling around in here. Can you imagine an army? They're ready to do battle. All of a sudden, they can't see. They, they, they're blinded. <laughs> and he goes up to the leader, the captain, and he says, let me help you here. You seem to be having a little trouble. This is another loose translation. Okay. <laughs> you seem to have a little trouble finding your way. Let me lead you. And he takes him, and they're all, <laughs> all these soldiers are grabbing, on, they're dropping spears and stuff. And he leads them seven miles down to the city of Samaria. <laughs> the, the Jews in the city of Samaria see him coming, and they lock and load. They're thinking, we don't know what's happening, but it looks like it's in our favor. <laughs> and he brings him into the city, and everybody's backing away, because this is the prophet of God. He said, boy, stay back, stay back. And they're all, you're going to see this, and just, I'll, I'll read this. They all got their bows feathered and their swords drawn. Oh, God, open their eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Did you enjoy that or not? <laughs> Try to put yourself in that position. This is the man who through faith escaped the edge of the sword. And they, they said to Elijah, Elisha, shall we kill them? Shall we smite them, my old cage? Shall we smite them? He said, don't you dare. Whoever shoots a prisoner, whoever kills, whoever executes, absolutely not. He said, sit them down. We're going to feed them. And then we'll send them home. They'll never be back. If you know you're going to come into that land and lose your sight, you ain't coming back. Come on. <laughs> He's got a pretty good ace card here. They ain't going to come back. Which is... Let me read it to you. <laughs> then the king of Assyria warred against Israel and took counsel with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. And the man of God sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for there the Syrians are come down. And the king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him and warned of him and saved himself there not once nor twice. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was very troubled for this thing. And he called his servants, said to them, Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? Who's the spy? And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha the prophet, who is in Israel? Who is in Israel? Telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. And he said, Go and spy where he is, that I may send and fetch him. And it was told him, saying, Behold, he is in Dothan. Therefore sent he there horses and chariots and a great host. And they came by night and compassed the city round about. And when the servant of the Lord, servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host encompassed the city, both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, for they who are with us are more than they who are with them. How many of you know that's true today? Would you agree with that? If you're, in, if you're on Christ's side, there's more with you than there are with the unseen enemy of our soul. Just know that. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened his eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, 
The mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. And when they came down to him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said, Smite this people, I pray thee, with blindness. And he smote them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. And Elisha said unto them, This is not the way, neither is this the way to the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to a man whom you seek. But he led them to Samaria. And it came to pass when they were coming to Samaria that Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes, and they saw, and behold, there were in the center of Samaria, and the, they were in the center of Samaria, and the king of Israel said unto Elisha, When he saw them, my father, shall I smite them? Shall I smite them? And he answered, Thou shalt not smite them. Wouldest thou smite those whom thou hast not whom thou hast taken captive with the sword and with the bow? They are guns pointed, man. Set bread and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master. And he prepared great provision for them. And when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away and they went to their master. So the bands of Syria came no more to the land of Israel. Who through faith escaped the edge of the sword? Now, there are many, many spiritual analogies we could take from that, but I don't want to. I want to go back to the day when that man was called. When God called him. If you have your Bible and like to go to 1 Kings chapter 19, I'll tell you the story, then we'll read the text. Elisha made his living by custom farming. He was 12th in a 12 gang plow and a yoke of oxen. Now, I've asked you if you could put me up a yoke up here. Could you do that now? Okay, uh, just follow me as best you can. This is lacking one thing. I hope I'm not going to mess up our mics. It's missing the yoke ring, which would be in the middle right here. But let me tell you what this is right there. That is called the yoke beam. Lovingly, let me try to explain this. This is precious to me, the yoke. Uh, my great-grandfather, Paul Charles, lived in the Beach Mountains of North Carolina. He farmed tobacco in, in the mountain. There was no level ground anywhere where he lived. And so he plowed with oxen, a yoke of oxen. I remember seeing pictures. I would to God. How many of you ever go to your grandparents or great-grandparents and they got this box with all these old photographs in them and, you're just, and you don't know who or what or anything? Any of you ever had that experience? I wish I'd have stole every one of them. Just fight my cousins for them to have these things now. I remember seeing one picture of Paul Charles, who my dad looked like. And my dad was a twinkie of Paul Charles. The old man chewed tobacco, and he didn't have any teeth. <laughs> Do you know what it looks like when you can't spit without teeth? <laughs> he wore more than he, never mind. It, it, you know what? My, his wife, Ma Polly, she chewed tobacco too, and she didn't have no teeth. <laughs> she had an ape, never mind. That's my, that's my background. But he was a yoke maker. That's what I'm saying. His name was Gillum. He was a Gillum smith, which meant a chair maker. But the truth of it is, he made all kinds of things. And he was a yoke maker. Because people in that part of the country use oxen to log with, to pull stumps with, pull tobacco to the mill, all the kind of things. To harvest. They just used. And he had two. I had a picture of him. He was an old man. And he had them yoked up. And they were air shires. Now, an air shire is a big heavyweight. They're, they're used for, there's all kinds of yokes. And you go to other parts of the world. See, America right now, we're so far removed from this that they think a yoke is the yellow of an egg. They don't have a clue what I'm talking about when I say this. <laughs> Would you agree with that? This is something we don't see anymore. Okay. So he was a yoke maker. I remember going into his shop even after he had died and it smelled, I love the smell of a wood shop. Any of you... There's, a, there's just, a, and he had the drawing knives because these here, you, he's not cutting these out with electric saws and stuff. This was just a big beam, and they made it, depending on what they're going to pull with it, they made it out of that certain kind of wood. It's going to be some real heavy work. They don't want the, because oxen have unbelievable strength. The Bible in Proverbs talks about when there is no ox, the crib is clean, but much gain is made by the strength of an ox. You get something near 2,000 pounds and put, that's the oak beam. Those are the yoke collars or the ox bows. On top of them, right on this side, see those two holes over there? When they'd put it around the ox's neck, it'd be in there what they call a keeper pin. And they'd push a keeper pin in to keep it looking. The round the bows here would push against this flank part of the ox, which would make the, the yoke push down against a hump or a, the back of his neck. And they would pull this thing, okay? Um, let me see if there's... And there used to be... A, there should be a yoke ring in there, which is where the... Um, 
would hook a pole chain to that would pull a, a plow. Elisha. Now, let me see. Let me give you a little more information. My dad said when he was a boy that he remembers seeing Paul Charles make a small yoke because you've got to start breaking oxen. How do you know what an oxen is? It's a bull that... And you don't hook bulls up. They fight each other, but you can hook oxen up, okay? Steers. And he said they would take a three to 400-pound steer, and they'd make a small yoke, and, a light, and they'd hook them up, and they'd turn them loose. And they would fight each other. He said, I see them. And in the hills, he said, they're just killing each other, knocking each other down, rolling and getting up and fighting, and just trying to get, until finally they figured it out. This ain't working. <laughs> we got to get along. And one of them became dominant, and one of them became submissive. And they just left them hooked up for three or four days. Then they'd unhook them. And then he said they'd get back together and they'd hook them up and they'd fight each other at first and just battle. Are you thinking about a scripture right now where Jesus says, come unto me all you, take my yoke upon you. One dominant, one submissive. They fight each other at first. Any of you? This something's got to be learned, and i got to be broken. The, you, the new believer, the young, to finally saying, your ways are better. It's better off you lead, I'll follow. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. They follow me. Um, my grandpa, not my dad, my grandpa, said when he married Ludella, that's their daughter, my grandma, he said, you just want to impress your father-in-law. And he said, I went out to work with him because all the chestnut trees, like in our time, the ash tree, the emerald ash, where the ash trees died. Well, back then, okay, this would be in the 30s. All the chestnut trees died. A blight came through, killed them all. And these are poor people, subsistence farmers. Their only money crop is tobacco. And they would cut down these big chestnut trees and they would haul them down to darter stores where the landing was. And they would take the logs, a train to come through and take the logs, and they would use the bark, they called it extract, and they'd use it in the tanning of leather, okay? So they don't get a lot of money from it. It's horrible hard work and dangerous work. But he said, I remember working with him, and I, I, he, he was skilled in it. He, he'd been done, he had broke his own oxen, started out when they were young, these two Ayrshires bought them, and they were... They were the top. This is like getting your John Deere. Okay, this would, this would be similar to spending the money, say, I'm, I, I know, and they're good for me for 20 years, and they had names, and they're going to learn my voice and learn my commands. One's going to be dominant, one's going to be submissive, and we're going to haul logs with them. We're going to plow our fields with them. We're going to haul things to, to market. We're going to put the tobacco on, take it to the tobacco barn, hang it up there. I'm going to use them. These are our instruments, okay, that we're going to be using, these two big oxen. And he said they were pulling these huge logs, and he said, the lead ox would always be the one that leaned into it. Got him, got him chained to a big log back here. And he said he'd start leaning and get his weight against this log over here. And he's talking, he's all he got is a little stick. He just pick up a little stick. It's called an ox goad. Then you never whip an ox. Never. You just kind of touch him on the butt and the flank and give him a whoop. Whoop. It's cue. That's you. the lead ox. We be putting all the pressure on him. He said, the next one over here is getting so excited about because he knows he's going to get his cue. And what his job is, is he's going to hit it. Anybody in this room that knows anything about pulling something, you put pressure on it and then hit it. And once it gets going, and sometimes the first lunge won't get it. Say, pretty soon, once it gets going, keep that sucker going because once it stops, it's hard to get it going again. Any of you thinking with me spiritually? Sometimes when you stop, it's hard to get going again. Come on. <laughs> he said, just pep. And he said he got so in love with these oxen. He says, after a while, he got where he didn't use them much anymore. Things were changing, and he just didn't use them anymore. But he said he, he noticed that those oxen, when he'd take them out of the yoke and turn them into the field, they'd work together so long. They're shoulder to shoulder. They, they could read each other's body language. And they enjoy it. It's like two horses that pull and mules that work together. They get to where they just, it's like an old dog, when you, an old hunting dog. You go out with your gun. He sees you coming. He gets lit up. <sighs> this is what I've made to do. <laughs> Any of you listening to this at all? Are you thinking spiritually with me? How do you know we've been made for another world? Would you agree with that? It, 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 it's something totally different. There's so much, so much we could take him. He said, but when, when he unhooked him. 
He said, and they weren't used as much anymore. He said, they would lay down together. They'd get up and graze. They'd still stay close to each other. One of them wanted to drink. The other one just go with him and drink. He said, they just... Lamentation says, it is good for a man to bear the yoke in his youth. You see, this is my last year of itinerant preaching. I can tell you this much. I still want to be near Jesus. Whatever he has us doing, I want to eat with him. I want to sleep with him. I want to do anything he wants me to do. I just want to be near Jesus. Because I've been in the yoke with him. Well, let me see. We are called co-laborers together with God. Well, I can't see my notes right now. I'm shooting hard for 8.30. Is that okay, Mark? Okay. I'd have been done. <laughs> you got a hard crowd out here. They're just a hard crowd. <laughs> I'm trying to blame shift right now, and it ain't working. Okay. <laughs> Are you ready for the message? Now, here it is. Okay. <laughs> it really is. I do want to give you this. This is just too good. You know, he had a... Uh, never mind. Verse 19, let me read this to you. This guy is fourth, excuse me, twelfth in a 12-gang plow. They did custom farming. A 12-gang plow. That means you had to make your own plow. I did a little study on this. The locust was the wood of preference for the plow. It's unbelievably hard wood. They had no metal plows for points until John Deere in 1836 to bust up the plains. Okay, so they're plowing, and they had to make their own yokes. They had to break their young oxen. Think about Elisha getting this, and he probably took great pride in his oxen and their yoke, and he's 12th in this 12th. Why does it even mention that he's 12th? If he's the last one to plow, any farmer, that's a vanishing breed. How do you know they didn't have GPS in those days? Would you agree with that, the big monster things? But a 12-gang plow, anybody will tell you, you can turn a lot of dirt with that many plows. Okay? And each one of us is a yoke of oxen. you got a guy running them. you got a lead guy that he's going to set. My grandpa used to take me out before the days of GPS, and we'd drive around the evenings because he used to spend the summers with him, and he was a dairy farmer. And he would look at the farmer's fields and he always liked to see one that was straight. Oh, man, just nice and straight. And when we go by one that was all messed up, he'd say, oh, so-and-so must have been drinking that day. <laughs> How you know pride? There's no occupation in the world that don't have pride. Would you agree with that? It creeps into us no matter what. And he was a problem. He said, I'll tell you how to sit a, a straight line. He said, you, look, you never look back. He said, you'd be all over the place. You're looking back where you're going. He said, look at where you're heading. Any spiritual application to that? And looking behind, forgetting those things... And reaching forth unto those things. You can't live and yet you can't do this. Well, the twelfth guy is the one who straightened up if they got messed up a little bit so that when they made their round, the next guy, when he, the first guy, when he would start to, he would have a straight line to go through. So he was a skilled, skilled plower. Very capable. And he had his own oxen. He had them trained. They knew his voice. They probably had names. I wish, I remember hearing my grandpa talk about the oxes that my pa Charles had and he knew their names. It was so, and so so close to him. This is this man. Here's what happens. So he departed from there. Uh, I can't give you the scene. The, the 7,000 not bow the knee to Baal and stuff. They knew that uh, Elisha was the bona fide prophet for Israel and that God had told Elisha, I'm going to take you up. You ain't going to die. I'm going to take you up. And so the word is spreading. He comes now. He has seen something in this young man, Elisha, godly man. And he says... Let's pick up the narrative. So he departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him. And he with the 12th. And Elisha passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. Let me tell you what, his gar what the clothing of the man would be. Now, Elijah was from Tishba. Remember when Ahab sent to consult one of the prophets of Baal about his health? And Elijah met him and said, go back and tell him he's going to die. And the first thing he asked him is, what did he look like? He said he was a hairy man. And then he described his clothing. It's no different today than as it is today. If you're from a certain place, there's a certain color that you know. If, listen, if you live in East Lansing, your colors are green and white. 
And if you live in Ann Arbor, your colors are blue and gold. And if you live in South Bend, come on, have I done enough? You know what I'm talking about. We all have, you tell where your colors are, where you're from, okay, just by the colors. And so he had some kind of a mantle, was an outer garment, many times sleeveless. But when you saw it, you knew where the person was from. And he comes to him and he takes his mantle off. Because this is what I did him. When they saw that color coming with all that hair, they said, I bet you that's Elijah the Tishbite. And when he came, it was either to preach against sin, pronounce judgment. I mean, a prophet's life was not an easy life. God told him, this is what I want you to say. And he many times didn't have many good things to say to the people of Israel because they were on the run from God. They'd made a mess. They had all kinds of idols and all kinds of, it was just a mess. Here's what he does. Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. I'm passing on the baton to you, Elisha. And he knew what that meant. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, then I will follow thee. And he said unto him, by the way, kiss my father and mother, you know what that meant? Go and stay with them until they die. Fulfill the child's obligation to his parents to care for them and honor them in their old age. It wasn't just run home, peck them on the cheek and take off. He said, let me go home and spend some time with folks. And listen to what he says to him. And he said unto him, go back again for what I have done unto thee? Question mark. You, you mean, he is the prophet of Israel. I mean, the prophets of Baal, the fire came down. Oh, you, you know who Elijah was. He's the guy that when they came after him and sent the 50 after him, he said, if I'm a prophet of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume thee. <laughs> The second guy comes. He said, you're coming with me. He said, if I'm a prophet of God, let the fire of God from heaven come down and consume me. Boom. The third guy comes. Let's talk this over. Okay. <laughs> he said, you're a prophet of God. Have mercy, okay? That's the guy, Elijah. And he says, I'm passing on this ministry to Elisha. Here's my mantle. And he kind of said, oh, man. These oxen, I got a good living. It's a, it's a good profession. I mean, custom farming. I'm, this is, these are my plans. I got, I got all these things planned out for me. Let me turn back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slew them and boiled their flesh with the instruments of the oxen and gave unto the people and they did eat. Then he arose and went after Elijah and ministered unto him. He just destroyed everything. He burned his bridges. If you want to turn over just a couple of pages to 2 Kings 2, watch this. You know his commitment? Whoa, what a commitment. And it came to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Crude map. Gilgal. That's where Elijah and Elisha are at. Now, he's already made the commitment. He's burned his bridges. See, when God called me to preach, I wrote my resignation out that night. I said, God has called me to be a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ, resignation effective 30 days from, and I left it blank, brought it home, put it on top of the refrigerator. And Joyce and I didn't tell our pastor, we didn't tell our parents, we never told each other. We began to seek the Lord, because we know that there's going to be a cost. If you're going to get serious about God, there's going to be a cost, some things you're going to have to lay aside, things that would hinder you, that God may say, do you love me? Puts his finger on something. I had one year as a state trooper from the day I turned that resignation in. I could go back, raise my hand, take my oath of office, and they'd put me back on the road. It never crossed my mind one time. I ain't going back. Anything wrong with police officers? Can I tell you something? God needs police officers, Christian police officers, like he needs Christians in every... But you see, God has said, no, I got something else for you. I got something else for you. I had, I had a dream. Joyce said she wondered... Because we went from, we weren't making much money, $35,000 a year, but we had full medical, dental, optical, enough life insurance to tempt most wives to kill their husbands and, and all kinds of things. <laughs> I mean, we, the things that the world says, if you got them, you've got it. All that junk. When that year passed, there's no going back. He burned his bridges. He burned his yoke. And it came to pass... Then he was going to take him up to heaven by a whirlwind. And Elijah said unto him, Tarry ye here, for the Lord hath sent me to Bethel. Gilgal, Bethel. 
Listen to his response. He said, as the Lord liveth and as my soul liveth, you ain't getting out of my sight. I made the commitment. You laid your mantle on me. You're stuck with me. I'm in it. So from Bethel, God said, he said to Elijah, Elijah said to Elisha, God has sent me down to Jericho, Gilgal, Bethel, Jericho. You only got the Jordan right over here. And he said, you stay here. You tarry here a while. He says, as the Lord liveth, my soul liveth, I will not leave you. At Jericho, he says, he's told me to go beyond the Jordan. You stay here, he says. Ain't you getting the picture? That's not in there, by the way. <laughs> he says, I'm not leaving you. So he went and they crossed the Jordan. The Jordan dried up and he went across. And, and there's 50 prophets scoping this out there, watching, because they know that he's put the mantle on Elisha. And they know that God's going to take him up in a whirlwind. He's going to take him. And they're watching all this. Let me pick up the narrative. And it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, ask me what shall I do for thee before I'm taken away from thee? And Elisha said, I pray thee, let me have a double portion of thy spirit upon me. It's amazing how many times I've wanted a double portion of God's spirit, but I didn't want to pay the price. I just want the, give me the benefits. No cost. No leaving. No laying aside. Just the double portion. Maybe you're not that way. I feel like such a wretch so many times. I want, want, want. And he said, you've asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I go, you'll get your, get your request. Eyeballs on. Would you agree with that? He said, I'm going to take my eyes off of you. And pretty soon, the chariots, fire took him up into heaven, and his mantle fell to the earth. And he went over and picked up his mantle and walked back to the Jordan. And he says, where is the Lord God of Elijah? The same Lord God Elijah had. It's the same one Elisha's going to have. And he smote the waters and they backed up and he walked across on dry ground. And the prophet said, that's our new prophet. That's the one. Seeing therefore we are compassed about by so great a cloud of witnesses. You may not say, you may think that's one isolated incident. You check out every one of the heroes of faith. They left something. Abraham, go to a land that I will show you. He said, where are we going? You leave, I'll tell you. Whoa, I like the map before I leave. Somebody say amen. amen. See, how of you would like to be the father of faith, the father of us all, but you're not willing to leave without knowing where you're going? No, hey, hey, no, I'm going to flood the earth and I want you to build a boat. You know what he said? Amen. He said, you better be, because anybody that ain't in that boat is going down. Say amen. <laughs> but you see, the hundred years, that nobody knows about that. He preached, God's going to judge. And they mocked him and scoffed until the day the flood came and took them all away. Moses choosing rather to suffer the affliction of the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Boy, this preaches easier than it lives, folks. I know this is true. But I tiptoe up to it too many times rather than dive in. Let me take it alone or anybody know what I just said. The Christian life is a whole lot more difficult to live than it is to just preach. Well, Brother Steve, I don't know how to close this. Let me hand the baton to you and as he's coming, I'll say these words. Maybe God's been speaking to you for some time about laying aside some weights. I don't know. I've often thought about my call to preach if God hadn't spoke to me a number of times. But I just wasn't ready to lay it aside. I don't know. And I'm not talking about becoming a preacher. I'm just talking about becoming a better man, a woman of faith, laying aside something that's hindering you. Maybe something in your life, some sin. You keep going back, repeating a failure, repeating a failure. Man, I've lived in that desert. What a wilderness. Say, we're going to strap this one on. Pornography was eight and a half years of slugging it out. I wouldn't trade that for all the tea in China, the freedom I have, 
the love that uh, that old woman and I have for each other. I ain't much of a preacher, but we got a good marriage because something left that shouldn't have been there in the first place. You're on. Thank you for listening. God.